think we're going to shed a few, uh, a few decades as, as the time goes on. As you can see, it is called Gunpowder, Huguenots and Hapenies, and I'll try and explain why we get to that. This is, first and foremost, it is a work in progress. Uh, I'm basically researching the history of Corker way back. So you will probably have undoubtedly find a couple of things that you know that I didn't about uh, this era. Please let me know, find me afterwards, or on uh, my website, turtlebunbury.com. Get in touch. Um, at any rate, by the end of uh, this half hour session, I hope that you will all become acknowledged experts in uh, explosions in South County Dublin in the late to mid 18th century. Very useful topic to know about in life. The um, first thing I should uh, declare at this point is that I am a, a relative of one of the families that uh, lived at Corker for a very long time. The, uh, let's see, can you flick me on one there? The Collies. Well, the Collies, and before that, they were the Finleys, exactly. <laughs> Um, and the Finleys, who lived in that house from, uh, from 1750 all the way through to 1959. My grandmother uh, grew up in that house. My mother knew the house uh, very well in her childhood. Um, and I can just about remember um, Edie Finley when I was a small child, um, who was uh, the sister of these two gentlemen. Um, and uh, these were the last of the Finleys, uh, as such, who lived there. Um, we have Bobby Finley and Guy Finley and their older brother Harry Finley, the three brothers. All of them died in the wars, as you may know. Uh, Harry died of dysentery in the Boer War, and then Bobby and Guy Finley were both killed in the First World War. Um, Bobby Finley in May 1915 and Guy Finley about 18 months later at the Battle of the Somme. And at that point, uh, Corker passed to their sister Edie, who I, as I say, vaguely remember, uh, who had married into the Collie family. And that's where that connection came. Um, and ab f about four years ago, I ended up going to the Western Front with um, my uh, brother, um, and uh, we tracked down the graves, or actually rather the memorial of both Bobby and Guy. And as I was driving up to the airport to fly out, I was on my own, and I was driving past Corker, and I uh, thought, God, I've got to get something to try and bring. So I span into Corker, and I didn't know what to grab, and I ended up, we can flip on one there, grabbing a couple of chestnut leaves. And within 48 hours, I was able to put Corker... Corker's finest chestnut oh, leaves beneath good. their names of Finley, Guy, Gigi, and Finley. Um, Bobby is, where is he? He's up here somewhere. It's up there. Finley, Ari. I don't know if you can read that properly. Anyway, um, it was, you know, it felt a good a little connection to them. Um, their, that uh, sadness of the end of the Finley line as such. It's funny that they should have passed away in France because the story of Corker, or the story that I'm going to tell you today, begins in France. If we can move on one, please. Uh, so this is a map of France as it looked in uh, of Europe as it looked in 1648, which is about when the first house at Corker was built, the farmhouse that that was there, initially occupied by a family called Mill, who appears to have been uh, a Catholic in the 1640s. Um, and then when Cromwell came to power, he lost his house, had passed through another family called Trundle, uh, and then ended up with a family called Nottingham. And, and the Nottinghams had it through uh, the 1670s, 1680s, that sort of period. But Peter Nottingham, who had Corker at that time, in the 1670s, 1680s, <coughs> supported the Jacobites. And when they lost at the Battle of the Boyne and so forth, he got stripped of his land, and Corker would be purchased by a Frenchman. If we can now move on one more, please. Now, all of it is down to this man, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, uh, otherwise known as the Sun King of France, <clears throat> who became um, the king in, of France in the 1660s. And what he did, he did uh, an extraordinary thing. It was called the Revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And um, I won't ask you to spell it, but basically, in a nutshell, his grandfather was a guy called Henry IV, a Protestant who had been king of France. And there had been really bloody, vicious wars, in um, religious wars, in France throughout the 16th and early 17th century, which had come to an end. Which, if I can go on one, uh, one of the highlights was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, in which, um, during a royal wedding, it's something out of Game of Thrones, if anybody watches the series, during a royal wedding in which uh, Henry, the Protestant, was marrying the king's sister, all his, he was a Huguenot, a Protestant. Sorry, the French Huguenots are called, uh, French Protestants are called Huguenots. They were all invited um, into Paris for this royal wedding. And in the days after the wedding, uh, the mother-in-law organized the 
uh, murder of 3,000 of the leading Huguenots in France. So if you thought you had a bad mother-in-law, you want to watch out for <laughs> Catherine de' Medici. She was as bad as they get. Anyway, what inevitably that uh, sowed serious discontent in France, which uh, was basically all-out war for a very long time from the 1570s through, until Henry IV passed the Edict of Nantes, and that basically made Protestant citizens nearly equal to Catholic citizens in France. And they lived in sort of harmony throughout the 17th century, until Louis, the Sun King who we met, said, you know, I'm going to get rid of that Edict of Nantes. And suddenly Protestants were back, back down, uh, personas uh, non grata, and uh, the French army was sent in to pull down their churches and their schools and so forth, if we can move on one. So the French Protestants, the Huguenots, are saying, hmm, I don't think we're going to hang around for another of those massacres. Let's get out of here. And a lot of them made their way into Holland, a lot of them made their way to England, a lot of them made their way to Ireland. And it was a bit of a stupid move by King Louis, because many of those who left, and the number of uh, refugees, if you like, we're talking about, is um, between 200,000 and half a million people that left. And they were, a lot of them were his wealthy subjects, his wealthiest subjects. And they were also um, extremely skilled in many of their, a lot of them were skilled in silk, plate glass, gold, silver, uh, the manufacture of watches and furniture and those sort of things. Others uh, would become very quickly prominent as wine merchants, sugar refiners, general traders, bankers. A lot of you will have heard of Latouche, the Latouche yeah. family who founded the bank that became the Bank of Ireland. Um, and effectively, so six of the families, a lot of them, as I say, came into Dublin and Yall and County Cork and other places. But six of these families would end up connected to Corker. And I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but just in case any of you are particularly interested, I shall quickly name the six families. They were the Cheno, Chenevix, Arabin, de Grangue, de Brissi, and Gruber. I have no idea if any of you have, uh, know anything about them, but just in case. So, what those families by and large have in common is that they were all military families. And this is where Louis XIV, Louis XIV, really shot himself in the foot because of those men who uh, left, who abandoned his kingdom, uh, 600 of them were Huguenot officers and 21,000 of them were fighting men. And they would change sides. And it is said that Louis never actually won a battle after he lost uh, these guys. If we can roll forward. Um, so when they arrived into um, England and Ireland in 1685, it coincided with this guy's accession to the throne. James II became king in these parts. And he began turning um, his kingdoms into a Catholic kingdoms again. So the Huguenots are thinking, oh no, we've just left all this, haven't we? What's going on here? And they throw their lot in, if you can roll on one, with King Bolly, um, who they decide, you know, he's the man for us, and they join him. And a lot of the ancestors of the six families I mentioned earlier um, at uh, Corker ended up fighting, if I can roll one, at such events as the Battle of the Boyne, and the Siege of Ockram, and the capture of Athlone. Um, in fact, a number of the people who actually lived at Corker were at these battles, fighting in the Huguenot regiments in King Billy's army. Um, and for which, in, of course, they were showered with land and um, money and, and so forth. Now, if we can roll on one, please. This is uh, a map of Dublin. <coughs> Very flashy. Uh, is, that all, is that really flashy? It's, 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 it's projector. Okay. Do. All right. Okay. Well, just imagine it's gunpowder explosions in the distance. <laughs> um, this is okay. Dublin as it looked in uh, 1714, uh, approximately, and the population of the city at that time was 60, 80,000, something along those lines. And there was a developer in that town called Louis Cheneau. Um, Louis Cheneau would go on to build the house at Corker. So let's focus on him for a moment. His family had owned uh, the Le Ballonnier estate. It was a, a big estate uh, near Rochefort in the west of France. They had been driven out after the Edict of Nantes was revoked. They said, right, let's go. They moved, uh, made their way to Yall in uh, County Waterford, um, which was a, a hotbed for Huguenots at that time. And Louis um, was the son of this man. He ended up becoming one of the property developers in Dublin at this time. Look how small Dublin was. You know, really, that's Trinity College there. Uh, St. Patrick's Well, I passed it the other day, they're trying to stick a Lewis track through it at the moment. Um, and uh, all along here, Ormond Quay is just here, I'll be talking about Ormond Quay in a little while. 
Um, so he was a property developer here and also in Goran in County Kilkenny where he rented Goran Castle from the Duke of Ormond for a while. Um, and he, in 1703, he purchased 104 acres of land at Corper, uh, which had been forfeited, as I mentioned earlier, by a man called Peter Nottingham who had joined the Jacobites. So he's the guy who bought the land. He also bought land at Finstown uh, near Lucan. Um, if we can roll on actually one more. So uh, we are talking Corker here. So he, uh, this, this, this map is uh, 100 years later. <coughs> this is where he ends up. Um, I, I really hope he, I've been writing about a guy who lived here at Ballymount, which we all now know as an industrial estate. But in his day, it was occupied by a guy called Sir Toby Butler, who was a leading uh, solicitor and lawyer of his time. And I was just reading about him. Sir Toby, uh, he used to guzzle wine in court and drink so much of it that his fellow law lords banned him from drinking. They passed a sort of special <laughs> act within themselves to stop him from drinking wine in court. And being a lawyer, he got around that prohibition by soaking chunks of bread in wine. <laughs> <laughs> so quite a, quite a character. Um, all right, so if we can roll on one, please. So Corker, this is Corker House as it once was, and as it was built by Louis Chénon. He built it sometime between his purchase of the land in 1703 and 1714. It was built in the Queen Anne style. It was a south-facing house. Um, it was probably built within the moat of an original castle that stood there, uh, and it probably incorporated the material from that original castle, which was probably put into the walls and so forth. Um, he built this section. This is an eight-bay uh, eight front with the parapet. This section is all him, and it incorporated um, the earlier house, which, as I say, we think was built in the 1640s, 1650s, here, um, which would later become uh, where the um, household servants did a lot of cooking and washing and so forth. It, it, it evolved over the course of time. Um, so while he was building it, he lost his wife, sadly, who died in 1707. Um, and uh, it, his wife had been with him all the way through when they were on the run uh, as refugees. Uh, I'm researching her at the moment. She's buried uh, just beside St. Patrick's Cathedral, if we can roll on one. This is um, a very early, uh, uh, in the Registry of Deeds, this is one of the earliest record, the earliest record I can find about Cork as such. It's from 1743. Again, you'll see all these uh, names, the French names, Chénot, De Brussy, um, Ch Chenevix, uh, Gruber, um, De Londres. So it's all the French are very much occupied. And what this is basically talking about is the, le the deed of lease and release of six acres of past part of the lands of Corker, Kilmateed Park, Kilmateed, Rainbow Park, has anybody heard of Rainbow Park? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the Potato Garden. <laughs> that, does that still exist? Potato Garden? Maybe. So, and what is happening, it's a little later, it's, this is 30 years after the house was built, but... Uh, David uh, Sheno is basically leasing part of it to this guy. Uh, his, his name is misspelled here. It's yeah. Theo Theophilus de Risi, who was a captain in the army, and he was also an army agent who was based just beside Dublin Castle. And one, this is important. One of his roles was gathering uh, supplies for whichever regiment was in the garris uh, garrisoned at Cork Hill, just beside the castle at that time. Because, am I going to get to, oh, if we can roll on one. Anyway, this is, I found his book plate, and that's, that's what he put in all his books. It's a gorgeous book plate with his name on it there. Theophilus de Blisi. Um, okay, if we move on one, just to uh, finish up with the Shanos. David Shano, who, as I say, he succeeded, his father built the house, he succeeded to the house, um, and he and both his wife are buried in Yule, if you've ever been to St. Mary's Church in Yule. Uh, they are buried in the south transept, and you, if you have been in there, you've probably walked upon them, because you can't get in or out without walking upon them. That's their gravestone, um, and so many people have walked over that it's almost impossible to identify it, that it's their grave, but it is. Uh, so that's where one of the Corker residents fetched up, if we can roll on. Now, before he died, actually a couple of months after his wife died, David Shano put Corker up for sale, and this is the first newspaper account I've managed to find so far. To be sold, the house and lands of Corker, distant four miles from the city of Dublin, on the north side of the Turnpike Road, leading from Dublin to Rathcool, containing the following particulars. So, um, what we have is at that time, the mansion house and gardens are being occupied by a guy called General Henry de Grangway, who is a, another Huguenot, who had been in King Billy's army <coughs> back in the day, 
and had risen <laughs> through the ranks to become the commander of the 9th Dragoons, which was the second most senior cavalry regiment in the British Army at that time. So very influential, very wealthy figure. He died a few years after this. He died at Newlands, actually. So he clearly moved out after the house was sold. And he died at um, Newlands and uh, in slightly suspicious circumstances because he was about to change his will and leave money to a mysterious woman when he got... And you kind of need Miss Marple to, to get involved. Anyway, there was a lot of whispering at the time about it. Um, and the farmhouse and farm was owned by somebody called Mr. Hildebrand Smith. Wonderful name. I know no more about him. We'll come back to Colonel Philip Shenovix. And if you wanted it, uh, you had to go and visit Mr. Redmond Kane, attorney, at his house in Stratford Street uh, in Dublin, which is now Wolftone Street, because Wolftone was born just up the road from, from that. Redmond Kane, just, just for, by coincidence, happens to be an ancestor of mine on the other side, so I was stunned to find him <laughs> rocking up here. Um, so I want to turn to this one now, the powder mills and Colonel Philip Shinovitz. As you can see here, the lease of lives renewable to be paid, he was paying, uh, included six pounds of battle powder duty every year. If you can roll on one, please. Now, <coughs> gunpowder. So uh, a couple of years ago, or a few years ago now, I was in uh, the southern states of America and I happened to go to Chattanooga, T Tennessee and walk on a battlefield of Chattanooga where I was taught all about the US Civil War. And by the end of the day, I'd realized something that was quite obvious in, in hindsight, I suppose, is that Whoever has the better weapons, certainly in old wars, whoever has the better technology and weapons is going to win the war. Uh, and that is what happened in the American Civil War. The, the North had better weapons than the South. They won. The same uh, thing was very clear to the army of William III, King Billy. Most of the reasons why he won his wars, both against James II and against the French king, the Sun King, was because they had better technology, better weapons, better gunpowder. Um, if we can uh, roll on one, and the gunpowder used in their muskets, used in their cannons, and so forth. And gunpowder is relatively easy to make, if we can roll on one. You need um, charcoal and sulfur, are two of the main ingredients. And then the third ingredient, if we can roll on, is called saltpeter, or potassium nitrate. That's slightly harder to get control of. Um, most of it was, be, was uh, in Bengal, in India, um, but Britain was eyeing up Bengal, wondering if they could get hold of it. So, by 1717, um, there's, sorry, actually, first of all, King Billy, when he was uh, winning all his wars, he was being supplied gunpowder by a guy called Francois Gruber. Gruber, we had that name, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Francois Gruber was the number one gunpowder supplier in England. He was based in Faversham in Kent where he basically supplied the ordnance that's the part of the army that dealt with, that ordered gunpowder. And he did so well during the 15th, 17th, 1690s that his two sons followed him into business. One of those sons, Nicholas Gruber, moved to Ireland in 1700 and set himself up on Ormond Quay, which we saw earlier. And in 1717, we're homing in on Corker now, he uh, appeared before the Irish Parliament, which was based in a different building on the same place where the Parliament on College Green. And at the age of 46, Monsieur Gruber, who was from Lyon originally, he also had emigrated. Um, he presented a petition to the Irish Parliament, and you'll have to forgive my French accent here, uh, in which he told them that he hath brought into this kingdom the proper artificers, that's the, the machinery, to uh, make gunpowder. He had brought in the, the machines to make gunpowder. And he was proposing to erect powder mills and to furnish His Majesty's stores with such quantities of powder as shall be requisite. In other words, he wanted Parliament to fund him to set up Ireland's first gunpowder mills. Uh, and he wanted money from them to do it. And he got it, uh, if we can roll on. Uh, this is uh, from a, a, a newspaper from 1717, referring to the petition by Monsieur Nicolas Gruber uh, to Parliament. And they agreed. They said, you're right, we definitely need gunpowder here. It is highly necessary for the defence and safety of this kingdom. And they ordered uh, from him, well, they reckoned they needed 300 barrels of gunpowder are necessary for the common annual use, and that they wanted another 100 barrels of uh, backup supply. Sorry, you can see that. 
um, they were going to pay him eight uh, eight pounds and fourteen shillings per barrel, um, and he was going to get advanced the cost of four hundred barrels to get himself started. So this went off, and it went to the Duke of Bolton, the new Viceroy, who uh, Jonathan Swift mem memorably described as a great booby. Um, and the Duke of Bolton stamped the patent and gave Nicholas Gruber a 21-year contract to build a powder mills. He homes in on Corker, if we can roll on one. Um, and the initial powder mills, we think, were built just here at Kilmatee, I believe. I might, I might be proved wrong. I'm not sure exactly where he built his first ones, but I presume it was down here. Um, and why did he choose Corker? He was part of the French community. He was certainly of known the Cheno family who had just built Corker House. Um, he would, um, John Cheno, who was one of the family, was treasurer of the ordinance, the guys who pay for the gunpowder. And um, David Cheno, who lived at Corker, was high sheriff of Dublin in the same year that he got the go ahead, got the approval. So you're, it's basically a big Huguenot love in that results in. <laughs> Uh, the gunpowder factory coming to Corker. It was also, it was on the banks of the River Camac, which is a tributary of the River Liffey, upon which he, Nicholas Gruber, lived in Dublin. Um, and you needed that. Mount, the mountain waters riding, rising in the slade of Sagart, the waters would have been absolutely vital to power the mill, of course. Also, the landscape around here, you've got to assume in that time, would have had a lot more trees, uh, maybe willow and uh, alder and such like, and that would have been essential ingredients for his charcoal supply. Um, anyway, he set to work building the mills and the storehouses and damming up the, the river Kamak. Uh, he also caught a, uh, cut a mill race or a, uh, a sort of artificial channel to bring in the water from another tributary called the British River. So he brought in backup water. If we can roll on one, please. Um, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is where, where we are. The powder mills here in 1816, but that's roughly giving you, so Corker's here, the powder mills are here, Pond Dawkins here, this is all along the river. Um, if we can roll on one again. Um, do you, how do you get gunpowder in and out? Or I don't know if he brought his, because he had to bring the, salts, the sulfur and the saltpeter in, um, and then he had to bring the gunpowder out, and gunpowder is a very dangerous stuff to transport if you're doing it by road, especially in those days, with the iron wheels and all the carts, one spark and you're in trouble, boom shakalaka. Um, so, um, they probably used barges like this. His father, Nicholas Gruber's father, had a fleet of barges like this in Kent, uh, which went up and down. This is obviously one that somebody found, and uh, uh, is, that's what it was. It was for transporting gunpowder. So he must have used something like that. So, they were up and away in this, by the 1720s, 1730s, supplying gunpowder as, as required. 300 barrels a year were being made at Corker. Um, they did have an explosion at the mill in 1733. We'll get on to that in a moment, if I may. It then passed to his, uh, the, Corker, the Corker powder mills then passed to his nephew, Colonel Philip Chenevix, um, who is a pretty interesting guy. He was another of the French families. Again, they'd emigrated um, uh, following the revocation of the Edict de Nantes, and uh, they were very influential in the Lorraine before that. Um, and he had married, sorry, his his father had married Miss Monsieur Gruber's sister. His father was killed in action, blasted out of his saddle at the Battle of Blenheim. Um, but this guy would go on to become the commanding officer of the Carabiniers, one of the most prestigious regiments of his generation, uh, and serves during the, the wars of the Jacobites, the Battle of Culloden, or those sort of events, if you know about them. Um, he was also, um, as well as being proprietor of the Corker Powder Mills, he was best friends of, if I can roll on, this was his best pal, Lord George Sackville. And we're moving into the 1750s now. And as you can see, very useful guy to have as your best pal, high up the chief secretary, big in the, in the grant of the, the Freemasons, uh, and was going to go on to become secretary of states and first order trade. Anyway, that's his best pal. Um, and between the two of them, they are in very prime position when something called the Seven Years' War breaks out. And there's two things about the Seven Years' War. First of all, it was nine years long. Um, and the second one is it could be classed as the First World War because it's France against Britain mainly, but it does involve all of the big powers in Europe, and it is fought in North America, Central America, West Africa, India, uh, and the Philippines. It's this massive global conflict, really, that goes on for nine years. Um, if we can roll on. No? 
and one of the most important uh, events that happened uh, was in Bengal in India, uh, which if you remember the story of the Black Hole of Calcutta, you possibly feel like you're in the Black Hole of Calcutta, some of you at this present moment. Um, anyway, um, it was, uh, it involved the British Army going in and capturing Bengal. Do you remember what, what's good about capturing Bengal? The, the saltpeter, exactly. So with that, and this is Clive of India here accepting the surrender of um, the Mir Jafar of Bengal after the Battle of Plassey in 1757, um, by which Britain secured control of 70% of the world's saltpeter supplies. And the French, um, it, it, all are in agreement, all historians to this day, that that's the moment when uh, France kind of lost that war and actually lost control of a lot of their empire and went spiraling on into revolution and everything. Um, but it was obviously good days for the, um, for the corker powder mills, because suddenly you've got a big supply of saltpeter, if we can roll on one. It's not just for military action, it is also for uh, more local uh, uses. Um, so this is actually in Australia, but this is a canal being blasted out by gunpowder. And that's one of the other great uses of gunpowder was to clear the decks, clear the runway, uh, if you're trying to build new roads, or as I say in this instance, a canal such as the Royal Canal or the Grand Canal. Um, because it is clearly very explosive. And now if we can roll on to the next image here. Um, okay, well, uh, yes, the annals are, this is not an explosion at the Cork powder mills, but it is a picture of an explosion to give you an idea. Because the annals are full of gunpowder explosions. Uh, I found one in, on the Dublin Keys in 1597, when a uh, gunpowder uh, storage depot exploded and killed 120 people. Um, the Grubers certainly knew about these explosions because at the very, when um, just after Louis Cheneau bought Corker, the early 1700s, there was an explosion at that big factory I was talking about in Kent, um, and there's only one person who was killed, and that was a 13-year-old boy who was rowing his boat across the river a few miles upstream. But that boy, a piece of the building landed on his boat and killed him. But that boy was actually Nicholas Gruber's nephew and uh, Philip Shanovitz's first cousin. So they were, in, you know, they knew personally what uh, the dangers were. The mill at Corker, it blew up in 1733. There's another one in 1751 where the general advertiser, um, a newspaper, said, an explosion carried off the roof of the mill with two carpenters on it, but very providentially, neither of them received any damage. <laughs> there you go, extreme sports. Um, there's another one in 1756, another one in 1758. Um, there's a rather nice one in the early 1780s where the explosion shivered the windows of the Sessions House in Nace. Isn't that a nice expression? Shivered the windows. Um, but none of them were quite like the one that happened just around here at Caldbeck's Mill in uh, 1787, which it's possibly familiar to you, but it's worth repeating. So this guy, William Caldbeck, set up what was a rival mill, really, and it must have been just around here. I'm sure one of you can tell me where it is. Um, and he built it in 1782. It was for the, um, the Irish volunteers. He was a huge member of the, the volunteers, the sort of local militia raised to defend Ireland uh, ostensibly against uh, France or Spain, because all the British army had left to go to America to fight. Anyway, he set up um, a brass foundry to make cannons, and he set up gunpowder mills here. And uh, it was all great, going great until 1787, uh, in April, I think. It was St. George's Day. Is that in April? I don't know. Uh, um, and on that day, 260 barrels of gunpowder went boom shakalaka. And, and that was a tremendous explosion, as the newspapers called it. It shook the earth for miles around. Yeah, it unroofed a number of local houses. It did all the stuff earthquakes do. It toppled stuff from people's dressers. There was a, the Monastrevan boat on the canal, all the glasses, the china, the window were broken. The windows were broken. Um, there was a report that uh, the concussion was felt so severely, even in Dublin, that it caused the fall of a stack of chimneys on Usher's Quay. Um, Gabriel Beranger, who was a Huguenot artist, he uh, attributed the destruction of the medieval church in Clondalkin to it, so it is amazing that the round the tower, tower survived. Yeah. Um, on the scene of the, um, of the mills itself, the ponderous ruins, tons in weight, were cast to a distance of four or five fields, and the ground was ploughed into furrows where large stones, hurled by violent impetuosity, had touched all the fish in a pond contiguous were found floating on the surface of the water. Trees were broken in the middle, and the remainder of the works presents a frightful spectacle of ruin. 
Um, I think Freeman, the Freeman's Journal trumped them all with this one. Mrs. Margaret Donovan, a respectable dairy woman at the east end of Clondorkin, at hearing the explosions, not only got rid of an old rheumatism with which she was afflicted, <laughs> but, that's gospel truth, but an aching tooth dropped out, <laughs> and her eldest son, an otherwise acute lad of 17, was restored to the full use of the tympanum of his ears and the articulation of his tongue. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> An ill, an ill wind. Um, okay, so um, the mills, he did, Corbett rebuilt his mills afterwards because there was still good money in this in the 1790s. Um, and uh, meanwhile, the Corker mills were being run by uh, the family of Arabin, who I mentioned, who also French, connected to the Chenevixes and the Grubers by marriage, and a, a, an eccentric character called Henry Arabin, uh, or Arabin. We haven't got time to go into him. We'll roll on very quickly. Um, just that Chenevix connection, if Tom Dawkins ever looking for a good matchup. Uh, Philip Chenevix's um, sister-in-law, Elizabeth Chenevix, ran the number one toy shop in London in the 1740s and 1750s. She also owned uh, some land in Twickenham that she sold to Horace Walpole, upon which he built this fine residence. That's what it looked like then, that's what it looks like now, it's Strawberry Hall. So you must assume that Philip Chenevix of the, of the Corker Powder Mills maybe went to visit uh, this place. And another, if we can roll on please. The other connection is uh, the Chenevix Trench family name, some of you would be familiar with. That was again from one of um, the Chenevix, a brother of the guy who owned the, the mills. His great grandson was um, this guy, the Archbishop of Dublin, and uh, who was himself the great grand, no, the grandfather of, Sh of Sheska, uh, Chenevix Trench, who was a leading nationalist in the early 20th century. Okay, we are getting very close to the end of this uh, opus, I think, 33 minutes. <laughs> Um, if we can roll on. Okay, so we're returning to Corker House. Um, on the morning of the 28th of November, 1750, and we can roll on to a different perspective of it, actually there, there's another side-angle view of how the house was. Um, on the morning of the 28th of November, 1750, uh, a banker by name of Thomas Finley left his house, which happened to be on Ormond Quay, and crossed the river and made his way up towards Christchurch Cathedral, and then turned into the former townhouse of the Earl of Kildare. Uh, the Earl of Kildare had moved out, he built Leinster House. Um, and this uh, building, if we could roll on one, this is not what it looked like, but it would have looked something like this. It was called Dick's Coffee House, or Dick's Coffee Saloon. And uh, this is a, a similar coffee saloon in uh, London. But this is where the gentry met back in those times to drink coffee and talk politics and talk about all the other crazy things they did and occasionally to attend an auction. And in this instance, the owner of the coffee house was a man called Richard Pugh. He was hosting an auction and it was the auction of Corker, um, which we, uh, I can't remember, what happens if you click on? Okay, yeah. So the lucky bidder was this man, Thomas Finley Banker. And I'm going to wrap up with a little backlog of the Finley family because they're quite interesting. We're moving away from all the French Huguenot stuff. We're now going to Scotland, which is where they were from. They were uh, largely from Perthshire and Fife and those sort of places. They had been bishops and sheriffs and so forth in the med medieval ages. Um, in 1547, there was a guy called Andrew Finlay, who was the sheriff of Cooperangus. He had two sons, John and Alexander. They were devotees of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was briefly Queen of France, if we want to get that French connection in. These boys uh, fought for Mary during a battle called the Battle of Langside, which lasted one hour, and they lost. <laughs> and after that battle, the, bro the brothers fled. Uh, they fled to England initially. But one of the brothers, Alexander Finlay, in the 1570s, is said to have made his way all the way to Ireland, where he fetched up in Killeshandra County, Cavan of all places. Um, that's what they say. It's, it's all a little bit hazy, to be honest. Killeshandra was uh, uh, founded by the Scots in the um, early 17th century, 1610, that sort of era. But anyway, family lore holds that, um, that the Finleys were there a little bit before, so perhaps he was first on the scene, said, oh, wait, lads, come over. I don't know. Um, what, um, if we can roll on one, they, if you, do, if, actually, if you go back to, to him, I don't know if you can see it, but he, I was very impressed by his hat, very fine hat. And I was trying to think, I knew I'd seen it on somebody else, and if we roll on again, it is indeed on jo Jonathan Swift's head. 
uh, which is, this is Swift's bust, which is in the long hall at Trinity, that amazing room at Trinity. Um, busts are much more accurate than portraits, I always feel. Um, anyway, as you may know, that I mentioned that Thomas Finley was a banker by the time he brought the house. Uh, here's what Jonathan Swift, they may have shared hats in common, but they weren't necessarily Jonathan Swift. His opinion were that bankers were a necessary evil in a trading country, but so ruinous in ours, and who for private advantage have sent away all our silver and one third of our gold. Uh, the Dean further recommended the enactment of a law to hang up half a dozen bankers every year and thereby interpose at least some short delay to the further ruin of Ireland. We change. We change very much. Our sentiments <laughs> alien to us. Um, anyway, nonetheless, Thomas Finley um, seems to have gone undaunted, and I can't work out, I'm going to wrap up very soon. Um, he did set up a bank, uh, apparently it was in the 1750s, but I thought it was interesting that, uh, if we roll on one, the Drapier's Letters, um, which uh, was a, a tremendous scandal in the 1720s, when King George I's mistress, the Duchess of Kendal, got the patent to make coins for Ireland, and she teamed up with an English ironmonger, uh, and they started making copper coins, half pennies and farthings for um, Ireland. Ireland didn't want them for starters, but they were also manufactured and they were of an inferior quality. Uh, and the Duchess of Kendal and Mr. Wood were making a fortune out of this. And Jonathan Swift was hot on the case of it, and he published seven letters anonymously. Uh, they became known as the Drapier's Letters. Um, but in one of them, he noted that um, he had talked to a banker called Mr. Finley in 1724. So this is long before Finley's bank was apparently set up. And Mr. Finley honestly confessed that he was ignorant whether Ireland wanted copper money or not, but all his intention was to buy a certain quantity from wood at a large discount and sell them as well as he could, by which he hoped to get two or three thousand pounds for himself. So setting, setting his uh, game plan fairly early on. Um, if we r roll on, we're returning finally to Ormond Quay here, um, which is where Nicholas Grubea had lived long ago when he was setting up his powder mills. It was also where Thomas Finley lived and where the bank of Finley & Co. got established. And with his money that he made from banking, he built up a property empire throughout counties Dublin, uh, Meath, Kildare and Fermanagh. He was helped, one more image there, by a cousin called Sir Robert Finley, who was living in Stockholm in Sweden and had become the number one owner of iron mills and iron uh, export industry over there, primarily selling wrought iron to the Navy, who needed it for making cannons and nails and things like that. And he would have been a big backer of that Finley's bank up in, in the 1730s, 1740s. So maybe he funded some of the bank. Maybe he funded how um, Thomas Finley was able to buy Corker. Roll on one. Moving on, Thomas Finley's son was a very uh, a leading figure in the Irish Volunteers, as we mentioned earlier. He would end up becoming the commander of the Dublin militia during the 1798 Rising. We roll on one. One of his best friends was uh, Lord Kilwarden, who was the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. who was killed at the height of the Robert Dermot Rising. This is him being killed. So they got very much involved in those events. And there are many other stories about the Finleys that we haven't got time today. Uh, but if we roll forward last time, Colonel H.T. Finley is this man here. He um, was a great-grandson of John of the Volunteers. And this is him here. And he was the father of E.D. Finley, who I vaguely remember. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.